In this video, I'm going to take a look at some of the most interesting aircraft of the Second World War. I'll include photographs of the planes I'm talking about, but unfortunately, as most of them aren't in Battlefield 5, you'll have to make do with some normal plane gameplay. As I said, photographs in the background with some artistic impressions as well, and as you'll see, some of these planes are very unusual. Starting us off, let's go for one of the most impressive technological advancements in the war. The Messerschmitt ME-262. This was the world's first operational jet-powered fighter aircraft. Design work started before the Second World War began, but problems prevented the fighter being operational with the Luftwaffe until mid-1944. The ME-262 was faster and more heavily armed than any Allied fighter, including the British jet-powered Gloucester Meteor. One of the most advanced aviation designs in operational use during World War II, the ME-262's roles included light bomber, reconnaissance and experimental night fighter versions. It was nicknamed Swallow in fighter variants or Stormbird in fighter bomber versions. The Jagdgeschwader 7 was a Luftwaffe fighting wing during World War II and the first operational jet fighter unit in the world. It was created late in 1944 and served until the end of the war in May 1945. They of course exclusively operated the Messerschmitt ME-262 jet fighter. However, this jet fighter had a negligible impact on the course of the war as a result of its late introduction and small numbers in operational service. What could have been if this thing had entered the war a few years later, however, who knows what sort of results would have changed. The Horten 229, one of Hitler's secret weapons. Walter Horten was an ace fighter pilot in the German Luftwaffe, having scored seven kills flying as wingman of the legendary Adolf Galland during the Battle of Britain, and his brother was also an aeroplane designer. Hermann Göring, the Luftwaffe chief at the time, laid out the specification for a plane that could fly 1,000 kilometers an hour, carrying 1,000 kilograms of bombs, with fuel enough to travel 1,000 kilometers and back, while still retaining a third of the fuel for use in combat. The idea was that this plane could reach Britain, drop all of its bombs, and then outrun any fighters sent to take it out as it came back to land. The new turbojet engines Germany had developed were required, However, they burned through fuel very quickly, meaning long-distance raids wouldn't really be possible. This is the main reason for the low-drag design. Less drag means less engine power required, which in turn uses less fuel and grants you further distances. This manta-shaped jet exhibited smooth handling, a primitive ejection seat, and apparently beat an ME-262 jet fighter with the same engine in a mock dogfight. A test on February the 18th, 1945 did not go to plan, however, with an engine failure, and test pilot Erwin Ziller attempted to restart the engine with multiple turns and dives, however, soon passed out from the fumes whilst his plane spiralled towards the ground. He died from his injuries. Even though Goering had approved the production of 40 of these 229s, they never made it off the ground. When American troops in the 8th Corps rolled into the factory at Friedrichroder, they found parts of the prototypes at various stages of development. Oddly, this aircraft was never intended to be used as a stealth aircraft at all, despite giving that impression due to the design. As I mentioned before, that was purely there to enable longer distances to be accomplished using less fuel with less drag. Now for a Soviet aircraft that attempted to allow a tank to glide onto the battlefield after being towed aloft by an aeroplane. This was an absolutely crazy idea, and for many reasons it didn't really work. The Antonov A-40 tank wings, or Krylia tanker, I believe it's pronounced, was built as a prototype in 1942, but unsurprisingly was found to be unworkable. The 40T, as it was also known, was attempted to drop tanks into battle instead of the usual approach of loading them and dropping them off. Apart from the fact that no plane could actually tow the tank properly due to the lack of power, there was a much larger problem. The tank was dropped without a crew, with the crew then dropping in separately, therefore delaying or preventing the actual use of the tank. 
It wasn't until the 1970s that the Soviet Union managed to effectively deploy airborne vehicles, and by that time, things had changed dramatically. The Messerschmitt Me 323 Giant was a German military transport aircraft of the Second World War. It was the largest land-based transport aircraft of the war, and a total of 213 are recorded to have been made. This thing was indeed a flying whale, and it certainly met the requirements the German Luftwaffe needed. They wanted an aircraft that could fly vehicles and other heavy equipment, and those six engines, three on each wing, propelled the 323 along at a steady 136 miles per hour. This wasn't very fast, and it got even worse at altitude with the speed dropping quite significantly. Despite this, the 323 was invaluable to the Germans, and was used extensively. The HE 111Z was a German aircraft based on the HE 111. Essentially, the Z was a twin design with two HE 111s strapped together. This was originally designed to tow the ME 321 glider, but had a minimal operational history. Interestingly, this aircraft actually worked and surprised a lot of pilots at the time. You wouldn't think it would be very successful looking at it and it did have minimal operational history but the fact that you could strap two planes together and actually fulfill the tasks that were required is quite amazing. To finish off I have a few worthy mentions that I definitely think you guys should take a look at. The first is the Feisler Fi-103R Reichenberg, I think I pronounced that right, a late World War II German crewed version of the V1 designed to disrupt Allied shipping over the English Channel. The pilot would be killed in any attack, however, the bomb would be far more accurate. This project was shelved in 1944, but you can see that it wasn't just the Japanese that had this idea. The Germans as well were looking to be more accurate with these devastating V1 bombs and would put their own soldiers' lives at risk in order to do this. The Cornelius XFG-1 was an American military fuel transporting towed glider. Essentially, it was a flying fuel tank. The vast distances of the Pacific Ocean caused the United States some issues, and before island hopping moved American air bases closer to the Japanese homeland, bombers simply didn't have the fuel capacity necessary to reach Tokyo and then return to base. Unfortunately, the XFG-1 was anything but spin-proof, and during one of the test flights, the first prototype entered an unrecoverable spin and crashed, killing the pilot. This shelved the idea as well, and it wasn't used. However, it was a good idea to combat that fueling issue. And finally, probably the most stupid plane on this list is the Vought V-173. A flying flapjack, a floating pancake, this thing is about as crazy as it gets. The first flight of the V-173 was in November 1942, and immediately there was an issue, with significant problems concerning the complicated gearbox. It was never used in the war and was simply a developmental aircraft. However, apparently it did work. It was also good for flying quite slowly and retaining its stability, which is something a lot of other planes couldn't do at the time. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you have any aircraft from the Second World War that you think I should be checking out, leave them down in the comments. These are some of my favourites that really opened my eyes and made me read about them because they are pretty crazy, especially that last Fort V-173. Some futuristic looking thing. But at the start we also had those jet-powered fighters and then the Horton, which apparently was one of Hitler's secret weapons but never really materialised to anything. Pretty incredible stuff. Maybe it's something you want to read about further. Hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like down below and I'll catch you in the next video.